Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole, and today I'm joined by Johnny Moore from the University of Pennsylvania and with Rachel Errington from the University of Cardiff, who actually have quite a lot in common, even though they might not realise this yet. I look at the horror on their faces when I say that. Uh, <laughs> they are, so we have the current president of Isaac and the incoming president of Isaac. So it'll be great to hear what Rachel thinks uh, John is doing wrong and what she'll improve in the future. Also, they uh, both had a career in the cytometry with cell uh, cytometry as a whole, not necessarily flow cytometry on the way through. And also both have startup companies. Uh, and actually, I'd say more than startups, started up companies that have been successful. So quite interesting careers and tracks to go through today. So Johnny, hello. Rachel, hello. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. When did you two first meet? Well, we, I first met Rachel uh, years ago, but through actually uh, uh, Isaac. And when her, she became involved early on as uh, not that long ago as treasurer and involved. And that is when I first met Rachel during that time. I knew of her for quite a while, but yeah. that's when I first met her. I was going to say there's two phases to knowing Joni. There's knowing of her and seeing her in the distance and watching her watching her operate, and then there's and then there, then there's participating with Joni and doing things and um, and all of that has been centred around Isaac. I, I was waiting for one of you to have a completely different memory of uh, when you first met. No, I think I think the the key thing here is that we have met a lot virtually because that's how the, the, the society, society gets together most of the time is by virtual because we're international. And so, yeah, I, it, it's strange not meeting somebody this year because of we've been virtual because of pandemic. So you kind of miss that once, it, once a year meeting because it is the only time that you meet. I agree. And I always say that I don't know everyone, but I know everyone who does know everyone. So it, in the cytometry community, in the greater cytometry community, it is actually a very close and interactive community. So you do know the names. You do, And the best part about it to me is that if I didn't know Rachel, and uh, let's say I had questions about track five, which I did years ago when I first started using some of that, I could, I wouldn't feel upset about going to Rachel and saying, who's the best person to do that? Even though maybe I hadn't met her at that point. And to me, that is what is very unique about this community. And that is some of our challenges right now that we can talk about in a little bit is keeping that, uh, close association as Rachel said we mostly exist that way but we've always had a live face-to-face -face meeting where we can get together and one of the main th memories in my life is when we had our meeting um, the first in Montpellier France many um, years ago we had two ISACs there but we used to leave the meeting and then the cafes in that town would be filled with cytometrists and we'd be sitting there drinking wine, eating good food, still talking cytometry. And I think that's what is unique about us. Yeah. Of course, so think it's interesting having the two of you here because you also uh, contrast each other. Because uh, a lot of people who join Isaac see it very much as flow cytometry, uh, as a as a, as a society, and it's not. It's cytometry, the measurement of the cell. So if I was to ask you, Johnny, uh, Johnny, what was your first cytometer that you ever used? An orthospectrum three. Okay, and if I was to ask you, Rachel? So for me, a cytometer is a tool in which you measure a cell, and the first cytometer I used was a Biorad five, MLC 500 confocal microscope. So, truly cytometers, but I bet, Rachel, most people wouldn't think of the confocal microscope as a cytometer. They would yep. very much see it as a confocal microscope. Yep. Joni, absolutely. 
urine a flow cytometer. And it's, I think you've got a challenge here. Uh, the society has a great potential to grow even further. And it's getting that microscopy community in or aligned with it that is still, uh, it's still very heavily flow cytometry biased, it I would is. say, as a society. It is. And we, we talk constantly about a challenge. And one is because the microscopy societies are pretty strong and they meet the needs of that community. I would suggest that confocal microscopy really started bringing, uh, bringing them close together because we're using fluorochromes, we're using different approaches than, than we did, even though we did use those in regular uh, fluorescence microscopy, I think confocal made it more like in people's minds uh, what we thought about cytometry. But I think what, what we are going into an area where we're starting to think about this field as single cell analysis, not flow cytometry. We're certainly doing single cell genomics in our field. Most of our labs are doing that as well. So if we think about that way, and, uh, and we think about even the journal, which is a journal of quantitative cell analysis basically now, then I think we'll come together because each technology brings something unique to the field and they're complementary. They're not one or the other anymore. That we well, let, let me throw this at you uh, and maybe get Rachel to think about this one because there isn't actually a natural home yet because it's so early in the, the technology of spatial genomics and spatial transcriptomics and even spatial metabolomics. Mm -hmm. they, they fall between stools. The microscopy community are very much on their super resolution and you know, volume electron microscopy, run the slide scanning type technology. I guess the pathology side it would fit into, uh, but that's not really necessarily the technologists and our user base wouldn't align themselves with that. Mm -hmm. And yet cytometers, Again, it's, it's now just a pure imaging platform. So is there a home and something we could do here, Rachel, do you think? Well, so for me, the spatial aspect of being able to measure a cell has been fundamental to what I have been doing. And also the temporal issues of, of, of how you can measure a cell over time, X, Y, Z and time. And I think um, there is a lot of crosstalk between within all of this, because you're using a fluorochrome, so you have to understand how you can um, get a quantitative measure out of uh, a, a fluorescent signal and a readout, and also the spatial aspects. So how, when you see a response to a, of a cell within a tissue, how is the neighborhood behaving? What is the proximity? What is the context of that, um, that behavior, that functionality? And that's where, where microscopy has, and, and the, the capacity to image has its real value. So that's when you can think about the spatial aspects of transcriptomics and really understanding the neighborhood, the niche, the, 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 the micro environment, if you like, um, of the system. And I think that's so important because um, being able to break up a population is one thing, but how is that really assembled within the tissue? And going between all of those platforms and that capacity is the most important thing. So it is not a one, a one size fits all. You have to be able to go across the platforms and really to understand the biological system at whatever level, whether that is at the whole cell level or at the transcriptomic level. The spatial aspect is important, the temporal aspect is important, but you need numbers and, and, and be able to have populations as well. If you have all of that, that's when you start integrating your data together, integrating the, 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 the knowledge that comes out of that. And that's when you start understanding the system. So I think that's where we need, to, we need psychometry and microscopy and genomics to come together and say, how are we really going to solve? This is the big challenge for us. Um, we can sit in our silos, but that isn't going to work. We have to come together and really share how we, how we um, interrogate the data from more aspects and you need your physicists there you need your mathematicians as well you know they all have to be involved in really in order to dis dissect that 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 information out because 
Um, you can't do it on your own. And we're getting very close to be able to do it all now. And it's how we bring that together. And I think that's, that's the future of cell-based measurements, if you like, um, for me going forward. I think it's, it's tantalizing and yet so frustrating because all these things that are connecting together, it's actually really hard to connect them all together properly. Uh, my, my PhD student at the moment, Laura, and she is a top math student that graduated out of York and we grabbed her because it is, it is the math and the computer science that we need to analyze the data. So she's using flow cytometry, but actually a lot of her data is single cell tracking and looking at the changes. And so these, she's using all these technologies yeah. coming together. And, and you know, we can teach her how to use a flow cytometer, how to image. Very hard to teach someone like myself how to do the maths and the computer science behind it. So I've had lots of conversations with, um, with, with youngsters thinking about where to go in, in terms of their biology and, you know, both as undergraduate, graduate and, and postdoc. And really maths is going to be fundamental to that. And, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we upskill to data analysis and big data analysis, all these things that get, get fly around, but really we need to, our biologists need to engage in that. Um, and so maths is, 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 maths is the new black for biology. It's the, you know, it's, it's where you're, we're going to make inroads so that we can integrate data, we can then interpret data, we can use modeling, visualization, and bring, all, and bring all of that together. So mathematicians are really important to us going forward. I think, uh, Jenny, you'll agree, I'm sure yeah. that high dimensional flow cytometry analysis has taken off in a big way in the past few years and yet still has so far to go. Yes, so I think, and I guess, um, you know, what I like to think about is there's a word that was floating around and Beckman Coulter and Paul Robinson used it years ago called cytomics. And cytomics really is where we are now in this field. It is not cytometry alone. It's it's really the integration of what you're talking about. And we recently just changed our facility name to Penn Cytomics because we're doing all of these things. Interestingly, I just hired a new postdoc, PhD in applied mathematics, as, as Rachel said. He's already created two or three new algorithms, and, but he's not constrained about, this is the way we analyze flow cytometry data or whatever. Because he, he has no background in that. He's learning it. Several years ago, when we first started our company, um, I, uh, one of my partners who formed it was, uh, is a physicist, uh, Wade Rogers. And he actually uh, did a lot in uh, computation. He worked originally in genomics, but he is someone who really learned a lot of the biology, but after the fact. So he thinks about it like a physicist. He doesn't think about it like a biologist. But I might disagree a little bit. And, uh, you know, yes, I'm old school, but you mentioned, it, you know, how hard it's put it all together. I don't need to understand in depth all of those mathematical approaches. I need to find people who do to work on the team. And I think now with, it's really all about single cell measurements, single cells in different cytomes, because if you think about the cytomics, you've got the tumor microenvironment as Rachel was talking about, as well as the disease and the ability to integrate all this because now we have the computational power to do that. And we just started another collaboration with a really big data guy here at Penn. He has the largest, uh, basically, genomics database of neurodegenerative diseases in the world. He does it for NIH. And he came to me and said he was very interested in cytometry. He thought it was very cool. Can we do for cytometry what was done for genomics? And I think you're gonna see a lot more of that going forward. Which is good because I, oh, I it's exciting. If you'd have looked ten years ago, I think some of the flow cytometrists would have been looking over that, looking around, thinking, "Have we got a future? Where right. is it going?" And it has really blossomed. It, it's really it has. And I still hear uh, peers around saying, 
are yes, but we'll replace it with single cell genomics without a cytometer. And, you know, we can do all the imaging mass spec stuff, so we don't need the fluorescent fluorochromes. I don't see it. Actually, I think we're the starting point. And yes. I think we're the ones that are going to be feeding these other technologies. Because those other technologies would, have, would almost run out of steam, possibly, if we weren't getting that visual context mm -hmm. and the single cell higher plex data and it's that that i think is going to push into and the there is a practical issue so for 20 years plus of my career i also directed the clinical diagnostic flow cytometry laboratory here at the university of pennsylvania so i did the research part and the clinical and uh it's a unique perspective because i always say on the research part we see everything we can do on the clinical part knowing what can translate and think about what's paid for and all those things. You know, everybody gets all excited about doing 10 colors in a clinical lab. I'm doing 40 colors on the spectral instruments plus, and we've got Cytoff is doing many more. So the trick is applying these, getting these technologies, and that's something that's a passion of mine that can directly affect patient care and patient well-being. And that is finding a way to translate from one to the other. And I think that's where we're going to be challenged a lot. I, we've got a lot of things we could do, but in the clinical world, we haven't changed much in the past 25 years. So that was gonna be my question, Joni, is how, where are the converters? How do you convert what we do in the lab, accelerate that conversion so that you, so it is affecting the patient. Um, you know, we, we work very closely with clinicians at Cardiff and, um, and, and we value that interaction and we, and we get samples coming from the clinics and so that we can enhance our science. But I'm not sure that we really are impacting back the other way as fast or as, as we would like. And so it's really closing that loop down, making it narrow and finding where the converters are. So you can be, you know, I see an ecosystem full of pioneers, full of innovators and converters. And with the, you know, and, and, and I haven't mentioned whether you're a scientist or whether you're a nurse or you're a clinician, it's those three kinds of individuals that really allow us to work Absolutely. together and impact on the patient. Because if we don't do that, we are being truly academic in, every, in, in the truest sense of the definition of <laughs> academic. Like, nothing wrong and with that. Really but... good science and four star papers, apparently that's what we get metric yeah. from. But ultimately, you want to have an impact on, on, on the patient. If you're working in the medical school like myself, that's, you know, that's why I'm there. I, I want to be having an impact Absolutely. on the patient. I think one of the ways that, that I've always approached it, and I've done it in a couple of fields. Right now I'm doing it in the whole high parameter field and, you know, how do I translate that? I work with the, uh, where the, uh, if you will, uh, diagnostic, we do the clinical trials for the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, which is a consortium of several cancer centers in the uh, United States. But what you have to do is have the conversations with the clinicians. And I'll always remember the one that was the basis for us starting our company was with a cardiologist who came to me and said, if a patient comes to me and says, doc, well, I have a heart attack and am I going to have a heart attack? He said, I can't answer that question. There is no test that I can do that can tell me. I can tell his risk is up there some. I could look at something like troponins. If he comes to the ER and is going to have a heart attack in the next three hours, but nothing else. And the cardiologists, who we always joke that cardiologists don't know from a flow cytometer, they, it's not used in their practice. He said, I just heard about flow cytometry. What can we do? And that was the start of us developing a clinical-based assay to look at extracellular vesicles for risk stratification for cardiac patients. So that again, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about that if I didn't have that interaction with a clinician who's telling me a problem. 
and a challenge that they have. And I think we need to have that that back and forth a lot because what we have expertise in is the technology aspect. You know, in our lab, we have both clinical and research, but in general, we're techno geeks a lot. In our, that's what our field is a lot. So we can find applications to answer this question, but we need a close partnership with clinical people to keep this going. I think uh, you brought up an interesting point at the end there, Joni. You are both technologists, um, just changing tack a little bit. You've both been involved in spinning out companies uh, to solve different problems. Uh, so in your case, you've got uh, Cytovas, Joni, and obviously Biostatus, Rachel. How, how you're in academic roles, you're developing a career that you're being paid to do, and you've got an idea for these spin out companies. That uh, spin out takes a lot of time, effort, energy. How did you do that? <laughs> would you advise anyone doing it? What, what tips and tricks would you give them? Well, uh, Rachel, you, you, you might approach was a little different so 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 i i was not a founder of biostatus so i arrived um as a postdoc in in the lab and and became involved in biostatus and what i see is essential uh, um for an sme to be able to deliver and what i think we're delivering um by by developing our floorboards is that it allows us to really understand what the common problems are and to see whether we can provide some solutions so so by status is not providing the drugs etc but it's but these are these are molecules that have to behave like a drug if it's got to get into a cell you know got all the same problems it's got to penetrate tissue cells get in label it's a, there's a target involved so it is a sort of drug discovery in its essence a pro discovery program and that's the other side of the coin is our is is looking at doing drug discovery. But I think in order to, you know, it's, it's a bit like, how do you share your science? You can share your science with publications. You can share your science by sending a bit of the molecule in the post, etc. But that's not going to have the impact that you want. If you want to have real impact in terms of people using your, your technologies, you have to set up a platform to do that. And it isn't going to be through really good publications, et cetera. That, 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 gets you, that gets you the recognition and the understanding of what can happen. And if you want quality control and you want everybody to be using a reproducible method, you have to have a platform in which to do it. That costs money to set up. You know, these, don't, these, these things don't fall, fall into the lap. So, so to by setting up a spin out, what you can, what it allow, what's the motivation behind that is that everybody has access to that technology. We're using it in a reproducible way. We're delivering something that we know is, is going to work in the hands of our, in, in, in everybody's hands. And that's indeed doing science. We want everybody to be able to use that fluorophore stroke product stroke assay. So, so that all our, our, our assays are reproducible and can be, and, and so when somebody's using that particular floor for, um, we understand what it means. So it's a means of getting a technology into the hands of many in a, in a very systematic way. Um, so for me, it's a no brainer on that's how you should, how you have to do it because there is, I can't think of any other way of providing that systematic approach. Now, in terms of effort, um, you have to, you, and, and separation and complex, you have to you have to be sure that you you understand what those are. And the key for us at Biostatus is that our, our, our the business is run by a non scientist, a, a, a you know a a talented businessman in his own right, and knows how to run a company. And us academics are involved in that company and steer the product development or the innovation. But ultimately. It's the businessman that gets the, that that keeps the whole show on the road, and so you it, again, it's a partnership. It's like anything; it's a really good team that you put together, and um, and you partner with to make that successful. I, I think you may have missed one other key aspect there from a from a customer's perspective is the support 
the help and support that is always available. And in an academic post, you can't be doing that. Yeah. You have your own priorities in an academic post, whereas the company yeah. gives you that ability, yeah. um, which is good. What about yourself, Jenny? So, um, first of all, I call myself uh, an at- academic entrepreneur. So I have always stayed in the academic environment, although I mentioned my partner, Dr. Wade Rogers, he did leave Penn to go full-time to Cytovas. We at Penn have rather stringent controls put on us. So for instance, I cannot have any named role in the company which is a stupid thing because if you don't let the inventors have a named role, it it comes out. I can, uh, I am an owner uh, and Penn mostly owns it, but, um, and, uh, but I can't have anything to do with, cause I can't even talk to investors if they're raising money. So it's very much a challenge. Uh, But we, what universities don't do well, we do very well in research of the R&D paradigm, we do the research very well. The development to get something that can be out to the world as we were just talking about, because that takes a different kind of money, it's not the money you're gonna get from a funding organization in general because it's, it's, it's developing the process and getting that out is, requires raising money. So on the other hand, what's been very exciting about doing this is I can see a way since my goal, our company was focused on developing a diagnostic prognostic um, assay, a system that can be applied to to predict cardiovascular disease at first and then now traumatic brain injury that could go out in the clinical world. And how's the best way to deliver this? We don't want, you know, early on we worked on a platform that was the only one of its kind. And uh, the company that developed it didn't have any plans to develop another one. So that's no good to us. I mean, it was good to us when we're developing the assay, but what good is that? Because you need to have these things out. We want to have them out. But I think the the synergy that we've I've been able to do uh, between developing those assays, again, talking to the clinicians, what is your challenge? Using the standardization which is very critical that you do in a corporate environment. Not that we shouldn't do our research level that way, but you know, it's much more stringent in that world so that you could develop, it's been exciting. And as far as side of ass goes, it was, um, it's next generation is in the process of developing. The first generation basically was sold and uh, sold to the American Heart Association. They bought it all the IP um, and cause they have an entrepreneurial side cause they want to further develop that. And now we're uh, working with some new investors and a, a new round the traumatic brain injury and some solid tumor liquid biopsies versions. But I, I, if I, I one part of me says, if I said I'd started this when I was, 20 years younger, would I have gone on that path? But then I think about it and I said, that was able to happen because I was where I was. I was in the academic environment, able to bring that knowledge and, and uh, move that way. So, so I think it's very exciting. I think it's really, I've had the opportunity in my career to see From the beginning, I started out in basic science. I mean, I used a little bit of flow cytometry, but I was really focused on basic science. My science became more technology driven as I went along. And then to the far end on a uh, uh, commercial platform. So 
I think it's, it, it, when you can take it to that breath, I think it's very exciting time. It was, has been for me, I know. So, but all that takes time and effort and yes, neither of you look completely exhausted. <laughs> so it's Monday and we had a weekend. Yes. You do have outside interests. So actually, I, I've got this yes. picture up. Jay, explain this picture. So we have a, uh, my husband and I, that's my husband, Roger, and my baby dog, Willow. We have a house on the eastern shore of the uh, U.S., on the Chesapeake Bay, and there's a small town that's called Chestertown. And the first weekend of December, they have a Dickens Festival. And what they do is close, yes, they close off the street and they put uh, uh, bales of hay and various people sit there reading Dickens. And then they have, you know, English food and uh, the, it's really great. So my husband and I, everybody does dress up. We got into the, uh, the spirit of things. So it's great fun. I, I'm intrigued to know what English food is. Yeah, tell us what English food is. Well, what they're doing it are those, uh, you know, the hard-boiled eggs with the sausage around them. Oh, yeah, Scotch eggs, yeah. Scotch egg. So yeah. it's generically uh, English, and there's some, um, again, they. I guess it does have a pension for Scotch because they have haggis, <clears throat> and they have uh, lots of things of, of those types of various sausages and uh but they also have, since we're on the uh, Chesapeake Bay, fresh shuck Chesapeake oysters that we do it. But it's, it, it's great fun. We love doing that and uh, dressing right. up and listening to all sorts of Dickens. What's your favorite Dickens novel? Well, I, Great Expectations is still my favorite. And I remember the first time I read it in high school, you know, was that thick and going, I hated it. But then I read it again in college. I mean, I didn't hate the novel. I hated the fact that it was so long and in high school, I didn't want to spend all that much time reading things. But uh, in college, I uh, read it again. And I really, that's really one that's up there. What about you, Rachel? What's your favorite? Uh, I, 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 I too, I too like Great Expectations and Pip is, is yeah. Is, is one of my favorite characters. And, and actually, if you want to see a really good film, the one with Richard Burton in it, I can't remember when that was. I mean, it's a black and white film of great expectations. It is, it is brilliant. It's really um, a, a great, one of the great, one of the great classics. A oh, Sunday cool. afternoon in the rain, when, the rain, when it's raining outside, Yes, um, we have a lot of that recently. <laughs> I think it's 1950s, Great Expectations. Is a, is a great Alec film. Guinness as well, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, as it comes up, so it's, it's uh, on the salt marshes, isn't it? The opening scene is that, yeah. that murky, that yeah, really yeah. atmospheric. And I, I spent 10 years in Brightling Sea with salt marshes on the doorstep. Uh -huh. Loved it for that reason. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but the opening sequence for that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. But here's a quick question. Rachel, what would you prefer, a film or a book? Well, I would probably say a book. But at the moment, can I change the options? Because at the <laughs> moment, my best friend is the radio because you don't only have to use your ears you don't have to what you don't have to see a screen because as you know we're all we're all screened out at the moment so the radio has become a, my a really good friend of mine and it's amazing it is it's got real depth of humor and intelligence and you know up-to-date stuff as well as storytelling so the radio has really become a big part of my life at the moment and what about yourself, Jenny? I would say probably Phil. And part of it is because a great sense of guilt in that if I take time to read something that's not science, I tend to be guilty because I can never read all the science I should read. And that's something I've never been able to overcome. I don't read 24-7. But, uh, but I feel guilty if I don't. Somehow I don't feel guilty if I'm watching a film. It's, you know, I, it's officially that. Okay, so next one, film or TV? Film. 
film? Real life film I like best. But nowadays, it's I end up watching, and especially after having gone through all this where there was no film to go to, uh, but I virtually never watch TV shows. I only watch film on TV. Yeah, um, I, don't, I, don't watch t- I don't watch TV. I, 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 watch, I watch films on TV, but I don't watch TV. Yeah, yeah. same here. Oh, you got to have a bit of trash every now and then just to zone out. <laughs> hey, look, I, a, a dirty secret I'll reveal is that when I just want to uh, to chill and know that it's going to be a feel good, I watch Hallmark movies. So they're all we know how they're all going to end. It's all going to be happy. The right yeah. person will end up with the right person who leads the way you think. So th- that's my guilty pleasure. I think so we need that at the moment, don't we? That's yes, a prediction we do. <laughs> because at the moment it's so unknown. So uh, a good a, a, something that you know where the end is going to be, I think, is perfect. So, what are your favourite films, Rachel? Um, so my favourite film from when I remember being the first film I felt really bawled over by it was Gandhi. I remember being a teenager and thinking this. This film has really got me. Um, I am forced to watch Star Wars movies by all the boys in, in, in our family. Um, and they've really grown on me because I'm being educated about them. Um, but I, I, I love a great film that, I love great filmmakers and, and that sort of impactful sort of, Gandhi was like that. It was, it was a huge film, it had, it, it was a, a film of scale, um, as well as, as talking about the individual. So I think I, I still stick to that film as my favorite film, because I remember, I remember the feeling of coming out of that film. And I think that's when you know that it's really got you. And Joni? So I like, there, there's three films that I really like for different reasons, but I particularly like films that are very reflective of the times they're in that have other aspects. I mean, they're they're a good story, but they have other aspects. And probably, I grew up in the South of the United States. So I have a a perspective. So Gone with the Wind remains, it was, it's a huge commentary on, on the time. And there's everything from strong women to comments on uh, slavery, the economic differences between the North and the South. And not everybody looks at those. A lot of, it's a very long movie, so they'll look at the love story. But I could watch that all the time. The other is one of my all-time favorites uh, is To Kill a Mockingbird and the original one. And I have not, just before everything went kind of haywire, there was uh, a Broadway play that was made of that. And my, uh, my daughter, I think Jeff Daniels or played um, uh, the lead in that, but my daughter saw it and thought it was phenomenal. Of course, she had never seen Gregory Peck in that movie. So she went back and saw that and really good. And I will agree with you, um, Star Wars. My son is a fanatic for Star Wars. He was born in 1980, close around. I mean, he didn't see the first one because he was way too young and ultimately did. And I have really grown to like some of the stories. There are some of them that I think are very commercial and aren't keeping with the stories. But I, you know, I think George Lucas is a great filmmaker um, or was. I don't know. I'd say he still is, but he was at a time. So those are the really... Uh, ones that I really like. So To Kill a Mockingbird was also coming to London and my oh. myself and my two sisters were going to go and see it and of course the pandemic stopped that so I guess it was coming from Broadway yes. to the West End and we were going to go and see it so To Kill a Mockingbird is definitely So great. hopefully we'll, we will all have a chance to see yeah. these things sometimes yeah, yeah. Peter, thank you for this experience because I now realize I've got more in common with Joni other than psychometry <laughs> like the same films God. moving through Rachel this is something you sent through to me so what is this picture of 
this is my tribe. This is fundamentally my group of my people, as I call it. So I have two sisters. Um, they're standing behind me. I'm in the middle and their children and our husbands. And this is really the group that really, when I'm feeling low, feeling high, feeling anything, this is the people I go to to, 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 to share. We're sitting on a log, which is a big piece of oak and in the New Forest. And as you know, New Forest oak is, was used to build the Mary Rose, which is a Henry, Henry VIII um, ship that got sunk in the Solent and fighting the French and all of that. And so we, um, my mother is from the New Forest and we were there to celebrate her life. But more importantly, the Mary Rose is a project that's in the family. So my father was part of raising the Mary Rose. He was part of the, um, oh, yeah. that supplied the compressed air, that supplied the, the oh. air to raise the Mary Rose. If you remember, it was coming up. Well, that was so, a big thing so, in the UK, wasn't it? It was a big it's thing, a it's a big thing. And, um, and so it's very special place for us, the New Forest, and um, and so we were there to. Um, so I think it's, it says for me, it says because it's all about context. It's like all images. It's not just the people in it. It's it's where you've taken it, and that has a lot of context for me in terms of we're sitting on a piece of oak that was part of the um, supply for building the Mary Rose, and so that sort of links it all together for me. Uh, that's that's super cool. That's really nice. So, looking on the light, we've talked about some quite serious stuff so far. Yeah, I've got let's lighten it up. Okay, let's get yeah. back into the lab. <laughs> well, so actually, I, I, I'm going to chat, I'm going to put in a, I don't know which way I'm going. Maybe think now, I think it's really important. You both reached the pinnacle of your careers. You, know, you both come up for presidency, coming up to, got presidency of Isaac. You, you're both in very high positions within your institute, your universities at the moment. But it's never plain sailing. Can you think of what maybe is your most challenging moment of your career to date? I'll start with Rachel on that one. So I think it's, um, it's really taking, it, taking advice and, and, and finding the right champions at the same time as ignoring other people's opinions. And in the end, you can only put a pathway together that is your pathway because life is hits you at the same time as building as building your career so i think it's really keeping true to yourself and sometimes that's difficult um and really trying to being sharp and thinking about things ahead um but also being able to adapt and i think that's really important and not feeling burdened by what should be happening what possibly might what, what others think should be happening to you at certain times and really looking at, you know, the, your career pathway is a marathon, not a sprint. And I think you need to weave your way through it and make sure you look after what's important along the way. Um, and for me, that has been sometimes stepping away from my science and thinking about elements of my family that's needed my attention and not feeling guilty about that, but also knowing that, you know, I can, I can weave these things back together again. And it's really taking the, the challenge of weaving life outside life with scientific life. Um, I think now that I have a status of responsibility, it's really thinking about how we can change things and attitudes on the ground of, of saying it's okay to have other priorities. There isn't a four star paper. There isn't writing a grant. It is okay at times for you to not think that that's the most important thing and that's not why you're coming to work. It's okay to feel like that. It's important to tell people that and, that, and that, it, that's, that's okay to be able to communicate that. And I think if we can have that supportive environment, I think we will do much better. We will keep our talents. We will nurture our talent and the talent will rise to the top. Um, I suspect that's not always happening because we're not, we're, not being, we're not looking after all of the aspects of being a person doing science. I, I think that's sage advice. Joni, most challenging time? So I think to have a particular time, I think Rachel alluded to it, it's perhaps being 
initially being a woman in a technology field that didn't have very many women. I, you may not realize, but this time at ISAC with me as president, Rachel as president-elect, Jessica Houston as treasurer, and Kylie Price as secretary is the first time in the history of ISAC that all four officers have been women. And I am the first woman president in 15 years and only one of four total. So the process associated with that may was very early on, I, I found it difficult to balance family life because I didn't feel like I had that freedom to do it. That if I wanted to be a success, I mentioned I had a son in graduate school when I, my second year of graduate school. So I, I really struggled with that in the early times of not being there for things, uh, for them, for activities at school or various things of that sort. So but do you I feel think, guilty? Do you feel guilty? Yeah, oh, guilty, you? absolutely guilty. You feel guilty in that, that, that you, it's not that you don't want to do that, but you, early on didn't see that there was any other path because it was still looking in an institution where I am, in an Ivy League institution, if I looked up the ladder, I didn't see me. There was nobody that looked like me, either a woman or a, a woman who had a family and didn't hide it. I never hid it. But I found some very good champions along the way who, by the way, happened, most of them happened to be men, but that's because there weren't too many women around to do that. But they were great. And um, you know you've overcome this when your dean tells you on a phone call uh, in June, Johnny, I know you'll be able to handle this because you're a force to be reckoned with. So I like, uh, and as I responded to him was, and don't you forget it. But, <laughs> but the point is, I think that exactly what Rachel said, one of the things that all of us have a responsibility for is it doesn't have to be that way. To let our uh, up and coming leaders and the young people entering the field and say, it's important. You need to come forward and say, I need to do this. I need this help. And I think if anything, um, the lockdowns that we've had where everyone was forced to take time away realizes anything could happen anytime to anybody and we can adjust. It doesn't mean your life is over. Your professional life is over. And I think we if we take anything away from what we've experienced in the past six months, that's what we should take away and really work with people to have priorities in the right place. Uh, you know, I had one tech who had a lot of family responsibilities and um, he, you know, a lot, of, we had a lot of 12 hour experiments. He'd frequently start at 8 p.m. But that was his choice to do that. It didn't matter. I mean, he could do it whenever he wanted. But being a lot more flexible, and that's what I've come in right now, the whole childcare impact because of virtual schooling that we're doing here is really impacting our postdocs, our techs, and our young faculty. They can't come back full time because they have to be home not to only to babysit their children, but to teach their children. Even, we without, have to. even without COVID, is the system still right? Have, have we come on no, par? No, no, no. We're, we're in much, we're in a much better place. I mean, science is a team effort, right? Team science, right? This is what it's about. It's not about the individual. So, so, so I think what you have to do is you have to, uh, and and as part of a team, you can compensate for strengths and weaknesses and and you can deliver you can deliver really high quality science impactful science 
in, a, in using team. But the problem is that still the metrics and the rewards is based on the right. individual, right? And so those two things don't match up yet. It's getting better, and it, but it's not there yet. You're, you're, you, are, you are promoted and metric based on your individual performance. But actually, the multidisciplinarity that we talked about right at the start is team effort. And, if, and once you're working in a team, you can compensate for the fact that life happens to individuals and you can build some redundancy into, into all of that system and deliver really high quality, excellent science, but working, at, working as a team. And I love working as a team. I mean, it's so much more fun than working as an individual and, share, and sharing the glories and, and, the, and the, 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 the upset when things don't work out how you think they should be working out. So I think... I think that, so team science for me is a solution to many things, but until you're recognized for working in a team and that teams are important, you're still going to always get those conflicts. And, you know, if you're going to demand somebody to work 60, 65 hours a week in, in order, and because that is the norm of being a good scientist, you're just going to lose, you're going to lose real talent. And I think you mentioned, I, I've heard you mention in the past, Rachel, about Careers don't have to be at 100 miles an hour all the time. They right. can take a period of uh, sort of slowing. So you can have some family life and then going back up again. I think it makes you a better scientist as well. Because I agree. Well, to, to be a good scientist, you have to be aware of the world, aware of the challenges, and you have to, you ha you have to be also looking after your family and looking after, and when you get in the, place of seniority you're looking after other people's families as well so i think you have to, i think it, it's about pacing it's about understanding when you have to put that extra extra effort in extra time but it isn't extra it's just part of what you're doing in order to get yourself and the science funded and delivered in a way that really works you know i've been a caregiver for the last for 30 years and there were times when i had to step away People rolling their eyes saying, well, you forget it, forget it. You're never going to do, you're never going to get to the next stage. You'll never be, you'll never be asked again to give a keynote at this meeting because you, you say you can't go to that meeting because you've got a family commitment. And look where and, you are now. And, 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 it's, and it's just like, well, tough beans because I cannot come today or next week because I've got other priorities and that's okay. It's a, it, you know, you learn now actually it's okay to make those decisions and it's the right decisions because i'm sitting here knowing i've made the right decisions along the way i think there's a good message for everyone there no matter what gender or bias you are of anything is to always understand from the other person's perspective and have that tolerance and understanding uh, to enable people to, to you know to balance their lives and there can be big things going in people's personal lives, which you'll never be privy to. And you have to understand that that could be happening. Always just don't knee jerk. Yeah, and don't judge, right? Don't yeah. judge. Why right. is Peter not here this year? Why haven't I seen a grant from yeah. him? Why haven't I seen a paper? Just don't judge. Absolutely. Don't, don't do it. So thinking of teamwork, you also have an interest in football, yes. if I'm correct. So, so, so yeah. this is... Brentford Football Club. The bees, hence you see the symbol of the bees, the bees. Come on, you bees. Um, and um, this is a West London football club. And it is the club that my father always supported. Because the other thing that you learn is that your tribe does direct a lot of how you behave. And so um, I've always supported Brentford. I will always support Brentford because the memories of sitting down watching Brentford or phoning my dad on a Sunday and saying, did you see the results from yesterday? You know, they did well, they did badly, etc. Is 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 part of my DNA, is, is my conversations about Brentford. I've lived in Wales for 25 years, coming up to 25 years. And the bees play Cardiff and I know the Cardiff team really well. I mean I'm into my football. I know I know my football. Um, and I know the Cardiff team really well, but I cannot support Cardiff. I could go to every match and I love football. I love watching, watching football, but I can't go and support Cardiff. It would be the sensible thing to do because they're on my doorstep because the, my connection is not just the football, but the people who I'm connected to and watching it with. It's the same with Wales versus England. I know both teams really well, 
but I cannot put on a Welsh shirt. I love Wales. It's been part of my, my, my life for a very long time, but I can't put on a Welsh shirt because England was the team that my father and I would always sit down and support. And so it, it, you just can't overcome that. And it's, and so that's the other tribal na na nature of supporting a team is that. So with a couple of good seasons, you've, uh, you've had quite a lot of phone calls, whereas with my dad, after every match, there's a quick call and go, let's not talk about it and phone back down. <laughs> well, that, that's the other thing, sort of very depressing. I mean, we've had a really good season, Brentford. We nearly got promoted. We, we bottled it. Um, and and um, that's very disappointing. But, you know, ultimately, they're my team. And so I'm, I'm, we're back to square one for the new season and I'll support them all the way through it. Yeah. Yeah, it's more exciting that way. So exactly. from football, Joni, you also support what is supposedly a football. It's not real football, though, is it? Yeah, we've got yeah. to face it. American football is not football. Well, you know, we yeah. could argue about that. So... The Philadelphia Eagles. So I grew up in Virginia. We did not have a football team. We had um, the Washington, now called the Washington football team, but they were called the Washington Redskins at the time, was the closest we had for Washington, D.C. But I was in high school, a cheerleader for five years. Uh, so I was very much involved in sports. So really, I, I can relate a little bit to what Rachel said about the memory. So neither, my parents were not sports fans. My husband and my son are definitely not sports fans. My daughter is a crazy sports fan. So she and I have gone to football games since she was in middle school. So we've gone to Eagles games and We've been crazy Eagles fan and painted green stuff on her face and all of that. But it's a lot of memories of that. And yes, she could not have married someone who was not an Eagles football fan. So she did. And my son-in-law is equally a rabid Eagles fan, as are my four-year-old and six-year-old grandchildren. So we... Come any Sunday, you're going to hear us talking, yes, our team's not doing too well now. Uh, they lost the first two. So we do, like Rachel said, commiserate. Oh, that looked pretty bad this time. But but that is definitely something that is a, a unifier in a lot of ways. And it does bring you, you know, the family memories and also, yep, go Eagles. So, so the other thing for me to say is that I was a teenager in the States. I went to school in New Jersey and girls in the States play soccer. Yes. So that's where I also got my bug for, for football was the fact that I, could, I actually played. You know, instead of cheerleading the boys playing, play, playing football, I would go and play soccer and, um, and, and you could do really well. So I, I played in all the school teams. I came back to the UK where girls are not playing soccer or football. They are now, but they weren't then. Um, and, um, and I played football when I, when I came back and played at Cardiff University as well. So, you know, it's, so the United States ironically gave me, the, gave me the, the, the footballing skills to actually play football because I was a teenager in the state. Okay, so, so Joni, Rachel, uh, at a microscopy meeting, there is a pre-Congress football match, soccer match. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll translate for you there, Joni. Soccer for yes. football. Though. The round, the uh, round version. Yeah, yes. Where, where, yes. Uh, where it's actually the, the core facilities managers heads take on the commercial groups and the commercial yeah. team. And it's very much mixed gender on the pitch. Uh, has to be it's all in good spirits. But you should bring that to Isaac, surely. Well, if we have... A uh, uh, face to face meeting in 2022, which we're hoping we'll have, which will be Philadelphia, <clears throat> would have been Philadelphia now. I could probably wangle the, the uh, University of Pennsylvania's field, and that would be a great thing to do, I think. It would be lots of fun and, uh, uh, to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a winger. And I'm I will winger. be the cheerleader. <laughs> we'll have to teach some of the Rachel American can play. Rachel. Rachel, Rachel could actually play, but I'll be the cheerleader. It's a good icebreaker. I, I like the fact that 
it is from the facility side against the commercial side. Yeah. Because I think it breaks down some, there are perceptive barriers between the dark side, as some people would call it, and the academic side. Actually, there is no difference. Not as much anymore. A lot of commercial side have come from our backgrounds and just chosen a different career path where their skills yes. are really needed. And we need the companies to have those skills inside them. So I think that things, those informal networking things are, are terrific for both sides. And it is all companies come together. And even for them, some of them wouldn't talk together of very course. often. And actually, well, it, it, it just breaks, it brings walls yeah. down. It's really, yeah. right, so there you go. There's an idea for, for, for something to work out in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking of light entertainment, can you tell what, well, it's always a revealing question. You can always think of some of the darkest moments in the lab, but usually I, I always think of some of the funniest moments I've encountered in the lab. So I'll start with you this time, Joni, because I, I, I give Rachel time to think on this one. What's been the funniest moment you've seen in the lab or, or in, in the workplace, whether it be conference or lab, wherever? Well, um, in the lab, so my lab group, I've been very lucky. Most of the people that work for me, my senior people, have been with me 15 plus years. I actually have three people who worked for me for about 10 years, left and went to biotech for 10 or 15 years, but came back in the past four years. So believe me, there is a pay differential, but they just like being here. So we always used to dress up for Halloween. So this is uh, a group, not all of my lab. My lab decided to dress up one year for Halloween as me. So <laughs> they all got blonde wigs of a sword and it didn't matter their gender or race. They were all me and I came in to work and they were all like that. There's another one that I didn't send you um, that uh, there was from um, Beckton Dickinson years ago, they had, uh, when they developed uh, uh, an instrument that had uh, was a fax van engine and it had uh, Diva software, but it also had something called an automatic sampling system, ASS. So they all again dressed up like me, but then put a sign on their behind that said Diva with an ass and said, we just bought that. So, uh, so that was good. But on a national level, there was an ISAC in San Diego, uh, not the most recent one, but years ago. And the funniest thing was several leading members of ISAC putting on a show as the village people, doing YMCA, totally dressed up like the village people. And it, that was really great. That's one of the things I absolutely love about this field is that people, uh, we're not only colleagues, but we can be friends and we can interact. And maybe you only see these people once a year, if that. And uh, it's very interactive. And one of the things you mentioned about uh, commercial is the synergy that's always been between the commercial side and the academic side, I have never seen in any other discipline. My husband is a physician. The pharmaceutical companies don't have the same relationships with the physicians as we do. We are, we need each other. We build each other. And I think having that kind of thing where, uh, that's why I think the, the uh, football game would be a great thing. And while we're trying to do more in that area. So that is, uh, you know, we're a community and uh, both sides of the community and thinking about what's gonna happen in ISAC going forward. That's something I think both Rachel and I are committed to is involving our corporate partners at a lot of levels. We have many of them, we, or several of them we've been asking to be on committees and a lot more involved than we have. And because you can't live without us and we can't live without you. Uh, so. Very much so. Rachel, what about you, your funniest moment in the lab? 
Oh. Oh, hang on a minute. Right, now this is going to be interesting. Oh, do you know what? Joni? Yes. Just disappear. When she comes back, we'll be gone. Yes. <laughs> so I've just realised that. So I live by the sea. And uh, that's so funny, guys. I heard you say that. But, <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, live, I, I live by the sea. And just before this afternoon, it's been a beautiful day. And I use my binoculars. And they are Zeiss binoculars. And I won these in a raff, in, in a in my first microscopy meeting, which was micro ninety. Oh in wow! Anna Smith, right? That was my first microscopy meeting, yeah. my first paper that I gave. Um, and I put my name. They said sign the card. You know, they say sign the back of the card, put it in, and uh, and I got a message to say that I had actually won the binoculars, and they were on their way, right? And so. Um, so I was waiting for them. And then they arrived and our um, lab technician, um, Barry Martin, I remember him well. And he taught me lots of things about being in a lab. And um, he said, your parcel has arrived, Rachel. I think it might be the binoculars that you want. This is great. So I unwrapped them and there's this great big box and unwrapped them. And in there were two eyepieces from a microscope, which were sellotaped together right and i pulled them out <laughs> and and i had unwrapped everything as if it was new i mean it didn't look it hadn't didn't look tampered with at all this box and i took them out and i went these are two eyepieces i haven't won two eyepieces have you have i and the whole lab just fell around laughing because of course they had completely yeah, yeah, yeah. Unpacked it and and the, and they went no this is what you want so i realized then that you had to to survive in this lab <laughs> I really, we, you really had to raise your game in terms of the pranks that you had to play, and so that that was that was my initiation to um, to, to doing pranks really well. Are, are there fewer pranks now in labs than there used to be? Yeah, very boring. Um, no, I think there are far fewer pranks in labs. There are far fewer. There are far oh, fewer. Oh yes, I think, I think um, in, it's like initiate. we said earlier. The uh, the pressure to succeed, which we really, you know, people trying to balance things. Uh, is, it, is it that or is it the fear of doing wrong or upsetting or offending someone? I think there might I, be I was going to get to that as well. Yeah. And we live in an environment where, where people, you know, I, I hate to use the often used term of political correctness, but I think because the problem with this is because there are really truly issues within academia and labs of inclusion and diversity so that, you know, they, and they're more, I won't say they're more important now than they used to be, but people are very aware of them now for right, rightly so. So it's, it's harder to uh, not think of those things and and to uh to do the usual light-hearted jokes that we do we still find time and uh you know the the picture that you deleted is me in a witch hat uh again i said halloween we still have our halloween uh uh issues um and we still do it and i had a big black mole on my nose and all of that and I, I used to wear my witch hat whenever I would we would have lab meetings and um, and when I was going to be a witch or another term that rhymes with that that my lab would say. Um, but I think it, you know we are and plus right now I think this whole epidemic is going to change things for a while because it's almost like people feel like. Well, life is so serious. There's so many problems happening that we we shouldn't be joking around so much. I mean, everything's so serious. Uh, and plus the fact with social distancing and all, I come in my lab, I've got 12 people in the lab, I don't see them. Everybody's in different places because they're separated or coming at different shifts. Yeah, I, I think we got more serious before that though. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think you can have fun though, can't you? I think you have yes, to be careful. Absolutely. You have to be mindful. You have to be aware. 
of who who's everybody around you and and etc. I mean, I'm starting to sound like a director now, and, and but but you can still have fun. Yes. And I think that that is that's critical and um, an essential part of um, of doing science is that fun element. So, um, but you know, a, a prank here and there, I don't think would. Um, part of being a team. We exactly. we are we are over the one hour mark somehow. Uh, so it's been brilliant. But I, I've got to ask just one last question. It's going to be a really short answer because I realise time is up. What's the next big challenge? What's the unmet need? What's the next development that's needed? I, I, that's a really long answer I know that could come out of this, but it's short, sharp. What do we need to solve next and how? Rachel, with you first. So I, 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 yeah. So I think, um, I think it's, it's pulling together the um, systems thinking on, on what, on, on pulling our insights together and how we really understand what the system, how the system works. So that's an intellectual way forward and the technologies that underpin that are really about, about the science, about, about the, the, um, the maths and the, the, um, the, the engineering of systems and how the information um, um, is brought together there. So I think it's, um, it's working, from, from my perspective, it's working with our physical scientists to understand biology. I think intellectually, that's what we have to be doing. And Joni? I would totally agree. I think we're at a step where we have tremendous technology. We've identified a lots of needs. We've talked about initially, we called it personalized medicine. Now we talk about precision medicine. We can do precision medicine. We know how to do that. We can take what we have, but getting it from the lab to the patient, as we said before, is going to take this type of interaction, these teams with our physical scientists, our computational scientists, and that's what we have to do. We're not at a loss for having the technology. We've got it. We just need to know how to deploy it, and that's where I see our future. I, I think you're both seeing if so you've got a lot in common. I know, exactly. <laughs> I've got a load more questions I wanted to ask, but it, it's gone all sorts of directions, which I think has been great. Joni, thank you. Rachel, thank you. You've been great to talk to. Uh, thank you for having us. Have again, and Our hopefully, pleasure. at Isaac. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye.